The technology gets there, setting up a framework. The title is Your Mind, Legal Status and Securing Yourself. And uh, give a hand for uh, Tiffany and James. I'm on? We're on. Uh, the first thing we want to say is that we need to put in the standard disclaimer. Uh, both of us are employed, but we don't speak on behalf of our employers. Uh, we don't want them to think that. We're not going to break your world. We're just going to make it hurt a lot. I'm Tiffany Rad, and uh, I'm a uh, adjunct professor at the University of Southern Maine, the computer science department. And I, am, um, I teach a class on computer law, and I also have a private practice in Maine. I'm James Arlen. Some of you know me better as Mercurial. I'm a part-time security consultant, part-time CISO, uh, part-time I write articles for the internet. Um, mostly I just mess with the world. It's important to understand that data and documents are used as interchangeable terms um, by lawyers and legislators. Uh, they're not always interchangeable, though. So working definitions, data is the lowest level of abstraction from which information and knowledge are derived. So you're thinking bytes, okay, binary digits. Um, a document is a bounded physical representation of a body of information. So it's a tokenization of what would be a paper document that you'd hold. Uh, sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't, but it's important to understand the distinction. We talk a little bit about uh, the difference between a living person or a business organization. And a lot of the law that we're going to be talking about today is about U.S. law. Um, we will mention some contacts from the Euro European Union. I'm actually a dual citizen of the U.S. and of Latvia. I, I doubt that there are any Latvians here, but Sveiks, in case they're watching. Um, but in, in the United States, a business organization is treated like a person in many ways. Um, it's, uh, it, it can be sued, it can sue, it can uh, form contracts. So this is, important to, this is important to us in our talk. We're talking about um, how an entity uh, can uh, have consciousness and legal uh, ramifications of such. The differences we're talking about here are stored communications. Um, in the United States, we have the Stored Communications Act. When data has come to rest, it has a different type of warrant requirement for, or um, uh, subpoena requirement for getting that data, as opposed to when data is in transit. The Fourth Amendment, uh, we're going to talk a lot about the Fourth Amendment here. And the Fourth Amendment, it protects you from unreasonable search and seizure of your, your possessions. And um, it only works within the borders of the U.S. Um, if this is at customs and you're a U.S. citizen in U.S. customs, you have more rights than if you are a European citizen in U.S. customs in this respect. And uh, the Patriot Act overrides a lot of the, some of the Fourth Amendment laws um, in the United States. The other thing to remember is that most jurisdictions have an equivalent situation. So this is you know, technically U.S.-centric, but it applies in Canada, it applies in the EU, it applies around the world. There's always this idea of uh, an unlawful search and the, the rules surrounding what can and cannot be searched. Um, we are talking a little bit, bit about, in the United States, uh, TSA, the transfer, uh, sorry, the uh, TSA in the United States controls uh, the security. Security in airports used to be privatized and it's now run and controlled by the U.S. government uh, by far. A Terry stop, um, we are going to talk about that when um, there's a reason for you to be stopped and searched. They must have, the, the law enforcement must have a reasonable belief to stop you. That's something that, a probable uh, cause that you have committed some type of crime. And warrants are required. And we're going to talk about third party permission to search as well. Your stuff, it gets even weirder. Um, you have a lot of things besides your person. Uh, you've got computers, you've got computing devices, you have stuff that is in plain sight, so sitting in the back seat of your car. Uh, you have non-related data, so that the target of the search may not be the only thing that ends up being seen. And sometimes there's issues with warrants being incomplete or uh, poorly built. We talk about warrants to external computing devices. We're going to be talking about cell phones and also internal devices, um, prosthetics, uh, different kinds of medical devices, and warrant requirements for getting information and data about yourself. And later we're going to talk about, about your thoughts. There actually is technology out there 
that um, they claim can read a lot of pre-crime thoughts. Um, car computers, that's something I know a lot about. I, I do some hacking of car computers. And with car computers, they're, um, it's, it, it, your European cars, doesn't matter if it's US or European, there is a, com um, a computer in your car that stores your driving habits. In Canada, and now I recently found in the US, um, they will give you better insurance rates for your car if you plug in a little box to something called an OBD2 port or CAN. It's, uh, everything's changing over to CAN standard, which a lot of Europe is on already. But it records um, such as uh, immediate stops, airbag deployment, how fast you were going. And if you tie that information your car is storing about you in with, um, we have uh, in the US the Real ID Act, we have a lot of RFID and identification now that as you pass over borders, they will scan who you are. And OBD3, we're hoping, is going to not be the way it looks like legislatures are making it in the U.S., but that's going to be a standard that will have RFID. And, for instance, you can be issued a ticket by passing under a sensor, and your car computer will be able to say, hey, uh, uh, there's a light out, the emissions is off, and they'll, they'll issue a ticket without actually being stopped by police. We're hoping OBD3 doesn't go that way. But what's important is... What your car is storing about you, you cannot access without breaking encryption, and then you've triggered the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the United States. So we're talking about small computing devices, cell phones, car computers, and medical devices. There's this idea that you can't be forced to incriminate yourself. Um, there's no perfect equivalent for the Fifth Amendment in Canada. There's no perfect equivalent for the Fifth Amendment in most other jurisdictions. Parts of it are covered. Um, it comes down to what do they mean when they say force you to incriminate yourself. Uh, but the basic idea is that you cannot testify for the state or the crown against yourself. And I have a case, just, just to exemplify with the Fifth Amendment, I'm working on a case right now in Maine. Uh, there's a cyber crimes case going on, and one of my students has some interesting code, some research through academia we've done. But if he's asked by prosecution, did you test this on live, you know, on the network... Um, he can say, I plead the fifth. And the prosecution then has the burden of going out and proving that he did it. They can't make him even on the stand, unless it's a, a grand, an impaneled a grand jury, but they cannot make him say, yes, I tested it live. So the law treats data in a bunch of different ways. And for right now, we're, just, we're driving you through some interesting stuff about data. We need you to think about data that is stored, not data that is in motion because that's treated differently, but data that's stored. So, oops. So, I, it, it is 2009, the year of cloud computing. I want to store my data on cloud-based application servers in the United States. How am I doing? This is where we play good cop, bad cop type of thing. Or I play the Fed and he plays uh, someone else. But um, The bad guy. I'm going to answer... Uh, if it's stored in the cloud, if you think by distributing your information in the cloud, especially unencrypted, is going to make it so that the law enforcement, if they want it, even across country boundaries, won't be able to get your data, you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> so I'm going to um, just back up the data. It's no longer a document, because remember, documents and data are different under some types of legislation. So I'm just going to push the data up to Amazon S3, because Amazon never screws with your data. Right, and here's where I'd say, as a Fed, I'll own you if you do that. Um, with uh, putting stuff, it, it documents other places. Um, it doesn't matter if it's data or documents in this sense, that they can still get search warrants. And Amazon, also under your terms of service agreements, and Google especially, will readily turn over your information uh, with a warrant. Uh, they don't do it without warrants, but they are, well, usually. <laughs> but they, uh, they, they have been known to easily give up information with weak warrants. 1984 is here now, man. So I'm going to rent a server at an ISP in the United States like Rackspace because they do awesome, good stuff. Um, and that's where I'm going to keep all of my data, the stuff that's important to me. As a Fed at this point, I, I would say you're, you're going to be owned. I'm going to get that data anyway because, uh, in fact, Rackspace might have easier under terms of service agreements for me to go in and get that data. They're, if I have a warrant, they're going to turn it over as easily, I think, as Gmail, uh, Google. So I'm going to own the server because renting it is a fool's game. I'm going to buy an awesome 1U rack mount. It's got 19 processors and... Sorry. Unless this isn't what once was Haven Co., 
I think I'm still going to have a really easy, easy opportunity to go get your data. I don't care if you own it or you rent it. I'm going to get that with a proper search warrant. But I own it, don't I? Okay, I'm going to move it to my house because my house has special protections. Okay, I'm still probably going to get it. Here's where it's different. With your home, um, you probably would be a lot more careful going over the requirements for the warrant. If you outsource your data, your computer, um, readily they turn over that. But if you have your servers in your house, you don't have any special protection, just that it's in your house. But I think you're going to be a lot more careful about what files that they make. They're not going on a phishing expedition on your hard drive. So in some ways, you might have more protection in that sense that you're going to care more than Rackspace will. And my roommate's going to let them in. I'm going to put it on a laptop, and I'm going to carry it everywhere with me. It is going to be my new best friend. I'm going to hide it under my shirt. This is uh, where we, we talk often about um, search and seizure in cars. If you have a laptop that is on your person or within sometimes what they call throw distance, um, I'm still going to probably be able to get a warrant, even with a Terry stop. If it's for some type of computer crime that I believe that you're involved with, if it's within your personal space area, I can still get a warrant for that. And uh, you think you... You know, your own, sorry. This is my non-hacker laptop. There's no stickers, so you wouldn't even think that I was going to be hackering. I'm going to put it on a telecommunications device because that's a completely different set of laws. And a telecommunications device such as a cell phone, that's a computer too. Um, I am going to still get that with a warrant. It's, it doesn't matter to me if it's on a cell phone or a laptop, your own. I'm just going to carry the data in a very close and... <clears throat> uncomfortable way. And I would say with a proper search warrant, I'm really not going to have fun getting it, but I'm going to get that. I'm going to encrypt my data. Doesn't matter to me if you encrypt it. I'm, if I have a proper search warrant, and sometimes it might take a court order, I will still, as if, if I was a Fed, I'd be able to get your keys or demand that you give me the key to open this up. There was a case in the state of Vermont in the United States where someone was coming over from Canada uh, with a laptop computer, and it was suspected that there was child pornography. A lot of these cybercrimes cases in the U.S., precedent is set with child porn cases, unfortunately. But um, the guy said, I don't have the key. I don't know where it is. I'm not going to give it to you. And it took a couple years in court, but the Supreme Court in Vermont demanded that he do, he had to give over that key or he was going to be held in contempt. Bruce Does it matter if I'm Bruce Schneier? If you think you're Bruce Schneier, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you don't get, as Bruce Schneier does, a get-out-of-jail-free card. When he does his security research and goes through airports and, and uh, kind of uh, plays some games with TSA, they give him a pass. Okay, you're Bruce Schneier. You are not Bruce Schneier. Um, I'm still going to be able to get that. <laughs> I like squid. So we're all talking about data at rest here. And I know you're all going, but why are we talking about data? We need to talk about a couple of more things, and then we'll get to the awesome. Now we need to think about data in motion. Okay? The idea is that data stored falls under one body of law. Data in motion falls under another body of law. So we need to puzzle out what we mean when we're talking about different kinds of data. We need to think for a minute about personal notes and effects and where you keep your memory, okay? This is the first kind of data that you need to be concerned about. We've given you a whole bunch of horror cases for how your data is not safe. Here's some interesting stuff about places where you're keeping data that I bet you don't even think about. And when we go through these, these, uh, these cases, think about what is your personal expectation of privacy when you walk into this room. I, you know, the people say don't take pictures. I, well, unless we have agreed as speakers, but don't take pictures. How about if you walk into a commercial store, a food store? You walk into a casino where you know they're doing um, facial geometry scanning. What is your expectation of privacy in public? So we're going to take you back to the 1990s. Anybody in this room remember the 90s? Parts of the 90s? Okay. Born in the 90s? Oh my God, there's a hand. Here's the thing, okay? Um, the PDA, back in the olden days, you started to put information in it because you were intent on not having to remember things. Um, we're talking about other people's personally identifiable information because you'd have more than just their name, address, and phone number. Like the, the public information, you'd have things like birthdays and relationships, and you'd have 
events that are in the future under Canada, the stuff that's covered under the uh, Canadian privacy law, includes um, forthcoming business relationships. So this is the kind of stuff that we were packing into our Palm devices back in the early 90s. Um, we're starting to bridge a line, though. You know, is, is this thoughts and memories, or is this personal notes and effects? Which body of law should it fall under, incriminating myself or, or carrying my stuff? We're going to move forward almost a decade to the early uh-ohs. You have a connected PDA. So now it's something that's replicating. The replicated copies are not actually held by you. They're held by your employer or by an organization that you have a relationship with. Um, does the corporation have rights to stuff that you put on your device that is your memory and your thoughts and your knowledge? There are a lot of cases in the U.S., and I know in Europe, too, about if you use your employer's email and you're using Twitter, for instance, for an employer's uh, computer, who owns that right? Like, if they're keeping logs of everywhere you go, all your emails, usually you've signed a contract and you've signed away those rights to privacy if you use your employer's computer. It's, what I often tell people is just don't. Only use your employer's com computer for business-related purposes because this is when you get into the problem of uh, who owns your tweets, who owns your emails. So now we're going to stretch it again, and we're going to say, okay, we're not just talking about things that you're trying to remember, but things that you're trying to remember to do. So it's a forward action. Um, think about cron jobs. Think about Google search alerts. Um, this is more about asking your computer to perform actions for you or on your behalf. So we're going from remembering something to doing something to making a decision. In corporate law, this is called agency. This is how corporations run because they can't actually do things on their own. They need people to be their actors. This is almost the invert of that. We need this not-person device to do things for us. Um, we're already getting there. I mean, I, I work in the corporate world. I'm that kind of dweeb. And my outlook is set up so that if I get a meeting request, it knows that if it fits this certain set of circumstances, you know, it's from somebody that I know and I've got free time and there's a half an hour before and half an hour after, it's going to go ahead and accept that meeting request on my behalf. The person at the other end has no idea that it's an on my behalf concept. They're presuming that there is now a relationship between us that says, I will show up at the appointed place and time. That's actually a contract. So how do we get this bright line between my thoughts and stuff that I've recorded? What does it take for a computer to become your agent? When I was an undergraduate student at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, there was a project that some uh, neighbors were doing that they were trying to get a computer to be a legal entity. They wanted to get it a social security number. It was going to vote online. Oh, this was back in the 90s. That wasn't exactly possible, but theoretically. And uh, they were going to uh, try to get it to open up a bank account. Um, there are obviously some federal laws there that they were in, in college were like, well, we, we didn't quite know what that is. We didn't go ahead and do all this, but we went through the process of what it would take to get a social security number for a computer that was acting as kind of like an AI entity. So the biggest thing you have to remember, and I, we're doing a really good job of giving you second channel information, uh, the computer is probably not yours in the traditional sense. You can't own it like you own a carrot. You're licensing almost all of your computer, regardless of your operating system, unless you built it yourself from sand and copper. Similar to, as I mentioned, with car computers, you don't own the software in your car. Most of the firmware you don't own either. In fact, I might even go so, so far as to say none of it. You own the leather, the metal. You can't touch those computers if they are encrypted in the U.S. without violating the Digital, digital Money and Copyright Act. So you don't know what your car is storing about you, but the automobile uh, manufacturing, uh, if you have it uh, service, they will know. So we're going a little bit into science fiction territory, but we promise there's a reason. What does it take for your computer to become legally alive? It turns out that you need to have this idea of a cognitive ladder. When are you able to make decisions? This is a very important concept in law. So we've got an existing cognitive ladder in law. Uh, you make decisions at different points um, depending on your maturity. Can we map that to the computer? Can we get a computer to climb that cognitive law? We've already got this. We've got it for children. We've got it for adults. Here's a horrifying example of what adult means. Uh, the, this is a, on this slide, this is a great representation of uh, majority, license, age of consent, 
criminal responsibility. And in the United States, if you have special skills, and the court determines special skills to be, are you a, well, are you a hacker? Do you have a computer science degree? Do you work in IT? If you do, and you are found, um, as, if found guilty of a crime, they might actually elevate the sentencing because you have special skills. Likewise, even for minors in the United States under 18, if there are some serious computer crimes that they found that you uh, committed, um, they can treat, treat you as an adult and try you as an adult in the criminal system in the U.S. So in some states, this means a kid who goes for a joyride in a car at age seven is treated as an adult in the system. So I have a seven-year-old. Um, I know the difference between a seven-year-old and a 21-year-old in terms of their ability to make decisions and think. Um, my seven-year-old is awesome, but she's not an adult yet. Sometimes the courts, if you're operating a machinery that is uh, traditionally only for adults, such as a boat, a car, they might hold the minor to an adult standard. So the other place where this concept of mature enough to make decisions or capable of thinking through the ramifications of a decision is when we look at legal cases involving mentally handicapped adults. Could a computer pass these sorts of tests? So this is where the judge would take the witness or the, uh, the individual who's involved, take them aside and find out, do they understand the situation that they're in? Could we get a computer to pass these same tests? What happens when we put Eliza together with Rain Man? And are these cognitive agents your thoughts? Have you spun off a process? Did you just fork your brain? If you did, then isn't it the same as your brain? What happens when you can take memories out of your head and put them into devices? We're not going to go as far as to say Johnny Mnemonic so much in this presentation, but we are getting to a point where with prosthetic devices, memory and even vision uh, can be put onto different computing devices that are external to your, your physical body. So lots of you use the Twitter. Uh, I certainly use the Twitter. Uh, does it mean that I'm establishing intent when I tell the world what I'm doing? Um, we learned from a case yesterday with uh, Johannes from Monochrome, uh, you can't actually take back stuff that happened on the Twitter. Uh, and your cell phone provider will cheerfully turn over things to the government. With a warrant. <laughs> um, I'm also one of those hipster types who loves the cloud computing thing because it is 2009. Next year, I don't know what I'm going to be into, but for now, it's the cloud. Um, I put all of my information into Evernote, which sits on servers in the US because Evernote isn't big enough yet to take my Canadian data and put it on servers in the EU where it will be private. Um, who's really in charge of that information? Uh, this is what Tiffany was referring to with the idea of prosthetic memory. Uh, this is something from Microsoft Research. This is real. Uh, this has existed for a number of years. Uh, it's Microsoft Research, but Microsoft Research in the UK. And they've developed a prosthetic device that is used for Alzheimer's patients that helps them with recall. And there's you know, published scholarly papers on this. It works. Um, it does low-resolution uh, still photos and audio recording until it detects that you're standing in front of someone, then it switches to high-resolution video. So you can review your day, and in the same way that we all learned when we were studying, you can do better recall of what happened to you uh, because you've had the opportunity to review. So you know this, this is not science fiction of the future. This is uh, productized. Some people like... Um, uh, Steve, Steve Mann in, yeah. in Canada have been doing this with recording everything that goes on during your day. In, in, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, he used to carry around like a CRT, big one, and uh, with a camera. And he recorded everything he saw, all the people he passed, license plates, everything, in public. And uh, there's an interesting uh, case he did for a show on TV where his wife also wears a camera. And they walked into Walmart. And in Walmart, they have all these cameras that are filming you all the time. And, and I'm sure you have an equivalent of Walmart. If not, Walmart has invaded Europe already. But uh, they, part of their business model is they record where you walk, what you look at, if you touch any items on the end cap, and they use that for stocking. Um, they claim they only use that for marketing uh, purposes for uh, which products are more successful than others. So when you walk into Walmart, you are implicitly giving your permission to be 
recorded. Also in the parking lots, they have a little sign up that says, uh, you know, you are being recorded. Uh, so Steve Mann walked in with his wife recording, and they said, you got to shut your cameras off. And he said, but wait, you're recording me. So uh, how is that that you can do this and I can't? Well, the, the way it works is he was on the property of Walmart. He'd given them their permission uh, to, to record him. He, had, he was actually physically kicked out by security. So these are all cases where we've willingly made the decision to put the information out there. You know, I, I put all the stuff into my phone so that I don't have to remember it. Uh, there are cases where it's non-optional to put that information out there. Uh, medical prosthetics are not dumb. Uh, they are now logging devices. I mean, you think about, you know, uh, it's, what, probably 10, 11 euro for 8 gigs of micro SD. That is a lot of memory storage, right? A lot of these medical devices are uh, for a convenience for the patient, have um, internet access, like Wi-Fi they're, they're, or Bluetooth. They're transmitting information. Um, either when you walk into a doctor's office, they have kind of like a, 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 a beam you walk through. Um, I know there's some um, insulin um, pumps for diabetics that will automatically upload your information um, without you having to press any buttons. Their doctor will have it on their computers. These are types of things where if, um, for instance, there are some uh, criminal, uh, well, people who have been accused of crimes and are on probation in the U.S., they have to wear a device that can determine if they have any alcohol or drugs in their system if they're on probation. And um, these, these are devices that uh, are remotely accessible. Uh, the, the difference is um, with that is they, as uh, convicted of crimes, they've given up some of their rights. <laughs> um, whereas it's interesting to think about with these devices, if someone comes up to you and says, hey, I want to see what, what's on your insulin pump, how much you, how much, uh, what, what your blood sugar level is, that's where, if you say, sure, here it is, law enforcement, um, you, they pretty much negated the need for a warrant if you just hand it over. And a lot of people don't know with these medical devices, they still do need a warrant to be able to access the information that's on uh, these devices that control a lot of uh, your health and personally identifying information. So imagine that yesterday afternoon at 5 o'clock, uh, someone passed away. And that person was fitted with an uh, implantable automatic defibrillator. And the logs suggest that their heart simply stopped beating. Uh, your pacemaker is subpoenaed because you were seen near that person. And it's discovered that your heart was racing just prior to that 5 o'clock moment when that person ceased to exist. Um, how much longer is it before we voluntarily or involuntarily end up with this sort of medical logging? I mean, that's a really easy way to put together the uh, case. He died at 5 o'clock. Just before 5 o'clock, your heart was racing. Somebody saw the two of you together. Or maybe they saw you on a CCTV camera. Um, I, my family does a lot with uh, security, uh, like electronic security systems in, in government buildings, things like that. And this is something that is really interesting to me that I found. It's called FAST, and it's a pre-crime detector. Uh, right now, it is the size of a trailer. And uh, about six months ago, the company making this paid 200 people to think really angry thoughts, like to get really mad, and to walk through this and to see if this camera could pick up information about them. What this camera looks at is pupil dilation, contraction, heart rate, um, if you're sweating, and also pheromone response. And that was quite interesting to me because some of these things are getting, if you were to want to fake it to get through security, that kind of stuff is really hard. There will always be people who will beat all the, I mean, any type of security, it, it can happen, but it's going to take a lot more training. Um, on the homeland, this is a picture of, um, on the bottom, uh, the bottom left there, that's what the more mobile camera is going to look like. And they're thinking of rolling this out and putting it in airports next year in the United States. Um, so the idea is, when you're in public, are you giving, inf are you giving permission to, have, uh, to be recorded? And we talk about, I mentioned Walmart with CCTV. Yes, you are in that respect. If you walk into a casino in Las Vegas you are giving permission to be recorded and watched. They do facial geometry scanning, and uh, it doesn't work very well, especially if you wear dark glasses, but they still do this and run it through like uh, uh, card counters and, and uh, people who have been accused of some crimes. But the question that we wanted to address with this, especially with pre-crime thought detectors, is when you walk in public, are your thoughts something that need to be protected in the future when we do have these technologies that are claiming, hey, you have malintent thoughts, we're going to pull you aside and interview you. 
So if my thoughts can be made public and can be used against me, what if my thoughts are conspiring against me? We're in, we're in a situation where we're depending on technological devices to make determinations about what we're thinking, which have immediate, usually negative side effects for us. And we know there's never been poorly written software. And there's never been people who've had the ability to exploit situations. And my computer's making binding decisions and even contracts on my behalf. And the government never changes their mind about what's good and bad. So where does that really leave us? We've chosen sometimes to externalize thoughts, memories, and to-do items. So this is the basis of cognition. Sometimes we involuntarily externalize those things. Sometimes they're read at a distance. I can take care of the first case. I can just abdicate from the internet. I'll go hide somewhere and be a Luddite. Um, I can't really take care of the second case if I'm actually ill. I need to accept the fact that without the medical device, I'm probably going to die. And in the third case, the law is just not there yet. So I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a security dude. And I am a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Sorry, it's a disclaimer that we always have to say in the United States. Um, you're probably going to be safer, but you're probably also going to end up being screwed in the end. Practical measures. Keep stuff in your house. It has a higher level of protection than anywhere else. That you control. More so, make sure those warrants are proper and it's within the scope of what they're looking for. If you have roommates, did you know that they can give, you, they can give permission to the authorities to execute that warrant? For shared spaces. If you have a lock on your door, that is, unless your roommate is also sleeping in that room, um, that is something that would take an additional warrant to get into that. Your, your roommate couldn't open up your locked bedroom. But shared spaces, if the roommate says, sure, come on in, you don't have a warrant, I don't care, they will search your house. Use encryption, but don't be foolish about it. Uh, one of the questions that we've had pop up uh, was, well, I'm going to use the hidden operating system feature of TrueCrypt. And I will tell you, in all of the work that I've done doing forensic teraparts on computer systems, as soon as I see a piece of software, I assume you're using every single feature of it, and I will hunt it down. Store your data in places where it's difficult to subpoena. Um, you might even go so far as to get your own satellite. And uh, I was very interested in talking to Ryan Lackey, for instance, about Haven Co., the offshore. There's an offshore platform, for, for those of you who don't know, that's off the coast of the UK. Um, Haven Co. doesn't exist anymore. They had some, some issues. But it was very interesting because they said they will never um, subpoenas, warrants. They, they wouldn't abide by any of that. They never had a test case. But it was interesting that as offshore platforms now are going to be costing about $2 million U.S. dollars. Um, there's a company in California that's going to start producing them out of soda bottles, actually. Um, that might be an interesting place. I, I predict one of the first things going to pop up on these, these offshore platforms are a lot of servers. I'm, I'm letting Microsoft Outlook make contracts on my behalf. Has anybody read a Microsoft licensing agreement? I may or may not be making a mistake. Beware of the powers you give your cognitive agents. Resist the urge to be all Web 2.0 work to maintain digital civil liberty and privacy legislation. That means look at those organizations that are working hard for you as members of the digital generation. Give them money. They and for instance, it. we are big fans of Electronic Frontier Foundation, that they are usually ahead of legislatures. And the legislatures in the U.S. at least, um, probably also in Europe, are about 10 years behind the tech. The best advice is simply... Your mind and your memory are not necessarily your own. Sometimes you've volunteered to give that up without even realizing that you've given it up. You've turned thoughts into data. Sometimes it's externalized for you, and you have a choice between ongoing good health, in most cases, and externalizing those thoughts and memories. And they're looking at it now. They're finding ways to pull your thoughts out from outside. There's Canadian research that's being done right now that I have to cop for because I'm Canadian. Uh, they're using infrared mapping of blood flow in your skull to determine which parts of your brain you're using. 
Uh, your brain uses an awful lot of blood, and blood is warm, and we can figure out if you're thinking happy thoughts in the happy place or bad thoughts in the bad place. And in conclusion, really do your part, engage with the general public, help them to understand that this has already happened. This is not science fiction, this is not crazy tinfoil hat, this is going on today. Work with the legislature. Generally speaking, it's people who've won popularity contests, not people who are qualified to understand what's gonna happen tomorrow. As hackers, you've usually been watching tomorrow. We all know the street finds its own uses for things. In this case, we are the street. Help them to understand. And I think most, more so this community, more than any other I can think of, should be getting very politically active with legislation donating to EFF. Because these laws, and once, they, once they go into effect, they're very hard to overturn. Right now, there are people trying to overturn the DMCA in the U.S., and it is, it is nearly impossible. So watch for an add-on for, like, save the troops, bring the troops home, because often there's some privacy or technology-related legislation such as this. And if you see, for instance, like I did on the Homeland Security um, Department's website, if they have pictures from the movie um, with Tom Cruise, Minority Report, and they're saying, hey, isn't it great? We can do this technology now with FAST, the FAST cameras. Say something about it, because uh, at least from when I watched my Minority Report, that didn't seem to me like a place we wanted to go. But Homeland Security says, yay, we, we can do it now. And remember, science fiction comes true. Everybody thought in 1969 it would be totally awesome to have a communicator and a tricorder. Some crazy Canadians figured that out. We've all got Blackberries now, don't we? And watch where you are. You are being watched by cameras. If you're from the UK, you have an inordinate number of cameras. You're on camera about 12 times a day. This, these pictures were taken by the Google van for Street View. And uh, they, the technology doesn't really blur out the faces very well, but if you're around a fast camera, think those nice thoughts. If you're carrying an AK-47 through a parking lot in the I'm going to use it position, think happy thoughts. <laughs> or you can go into a database forever with there can only be one associated with your image and legal name. Here's the important thing, though. This stuff is happening right now. This is a news story from last week. You will give up your crypto keys. Why? Because you will give up your crypto keys. Your information will go over your home internet connection. Now, we know that internet connections in Europe are awesome. I've heard that we're not actually using enough bandwidth here, but I don't know how to use more bandwidth because I'm from a broadband-starved country, and we don't know. We, we have no idea. But we also know that, in the case of Canada, it's a regulated duopoly who's responsible for more than 90% of internet connections, and we know they never do bad things with our data, right? We always trust regulated monopolies and duopolies. And by satellite, they're only $8,000. Maybe every hackerspace should launch one. <laughs> we have time for some Q&A. Thank you. Okay, question in the back row. Can you come up and use the microphone so we can find out who you are? And yeah, if people just want to come to the microphone, make a line, and they'll be glad to answer your questions. Especially we want to thank everybody who's helped us. do. A lot of this research has been impossible to find real answers to. Very oh, good no. talk. Very good talk. Thank you for being here. Um, come closer. Super closer crazy, crazy hypothetical time. Yes. I have an encrypted volume that I'm going to set up. Yes. And in the process where it says, now you type your passphrase, yes. I pick someone online who's like in my buddy list that I don't actually know, and I say, hey, VNC into my computer, type a phrase that I don't know. And every time I need to access that file, I have to hope they're online and hope they VNC in. Does it really just come down to how crotchety the judge is or something? And if I, they say, you have to decrypt this, and I say, I, I don't know. I don't know who this person is. Am I still looking at a contempt charge? It, it or am I looking at, like, well, you obviously were doing something wrong anyway? It, it depends on the system of law. Um, in Canada, you would be held at the Queen's pleasure. Um, 
She's usually happy, but um, sometimes I've heard she can be tough. She was a mechanic in the war, you know. Uh, you're probably going to be in jail until you figure out how to find that person. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've had more questions about key obfuscation than any other part of this talk. And what it comes down to at the end of the day is they'll get your key. Um, there's this place where they send people they don't like. It's a Holiday Island destination, really. Um, I don't think they'd actually send you there, but when you look at it, and actually you're the perfect person to talk to about this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Deviant Alum, by the way. Um, when you look at it, is your encryption key really any different from the key to the front door of your house? Or yes and no. Or under law, is it almost exactly the same thing? Interesting way of thinking of it. So maybe the cops just don't want to bust your door down. Maybe they're going to ask you for your keys. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, if they arrested you, they'd have the contents of your pockets. Mm -hmm. They'd probably not bust your door down. Uh, some of them would, because they <laughs> like doing that. But probably they'd just take the keys out of your evidence packet and go and open your door. And for instance, uh, the first World Trade Center bombing of uh, when they bombed the garage in one of the World Trade Center buildings, um, there was a laptop recovered, and it had really, really good encryption on it. The, uh, they, the uh, perpetrator of, um, accused of the crime never turned over the keys, and still the NSA to this day has not been able to break it. But he's, he's still also still in jail. In jail. <laughs> All righty. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I have a question on the uh, fast um, thing. Um, do you have any information on how they're balancing uh, the uh, false positives and, mix, uh, and missed negatives, so the alpha and the beta risks, how they calibrated that? Right now, there are really high false positives, um, but they claim by next year, before they roll this out, it will be less than a tenth of a percent. That's pretty incredible when they're talking about thought crime reading. But, okay. but they're, they're, they're going to build it using the biometric standard, which is it's better to be extra right than it is to be wrong. So it's going to be uh, built in the wrong direction. This is the problem does, does with... Does that mean they're going to maximize uh, not missing a terrorist, or are they going to maximize or minimize the risk of arresting an innocent person? Uh, they don't care how many people they have to process through the little dark room. Okay. They're going to pull everybody in that they possibly can. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, from... Purely a legal standpoint, uh, in your talk you used contempt charge several times and generally the, the public opinion is they're going to get you anyway. Is the contempt charge becoming kind of blanket, uh, bust your door law that uh, can be used in pretty much any situation without uh, any, any process or any anything or there are limits to which where it pretty much ends and there is nothing anybody can do to you. So, quick rephrase on the question, is there a limit to what you can be held for in a contempt charge? Um, it's jurisdictionally challenging. Uh, some jurisdictions, if you sneeze in court, uh, you can be held on a contempt charge. There was a case actually just last week of a guy who yawned loudly in court and was held on contempt charges. In the United States, contempt is a really interesting kind of uh, area where um, uh, there's an episode in a 1990 uh, show, Ellie McBeal, where a lawyer was held in contempt for having a skirt too short. Um, there was a 2600, well, Emmanuel Goldstein was, was in a case and a judge found that uh, a lawyer was wearing, I believe, pants and he, women should wear skirts in court. I mean, Leather, okay, yeah, and she went and bought uh, some leather stuff, and then he said, you're mocking my court. So judges are very um, strict when it comes to what's in their courtroom, and they can hold you in contempt for a very long time. But is it absolute or is it appealable? Hmm. It, it, it depends on if you have a court order and you're, you're told to do something, such as turn over your crypto keys and you don't, I think that's one that's, you know, you're going you're gonna to sit for a while. If it's about uh, clothing or not saying your honor, I've heard people not say your honor, even lawyers, and they're, they're held in contempt and spend a night in jail. Um, that's something that could be appealable. But I'll say if it's, if it's technical, like uh, a lot of the cyber crimes cases I do, if you're in contempt for not turning over keys, that's, um, that's concerning. <laughs> it's, it's not as easily appealable. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, I, um, uh, yesterday there was a uh, talk about uh, uh, detection in malware software and they used a technique called TLP, which is time lock puzzles, which will allow you to encrypt data in such a way that it won't be, uh, unless you have the key, it won't be uh, decryptable in a set amount of time, say 10 years. And say, for instance, you take a completely random key. You don't know the key. What happens legally to you when you present, well, I have this data, you can have it, but you won't be able physically to open it in 10 years. And I, don't, I can't give you the key because it's completely random. That's, we, we talked about this. Uh, James and I were talking about this. If you tell a court that, you better be really convincing that you don't know the key the, you, you can't get it for 10 years, even with uh, the court or the law enforcement trying a lot of things. They're going to really put you through the ringer for that one. I mean, I, from the cases I've seen with cyber crimes, and really, if you want to protect your data, encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. I mean, everyone knows that, I think, in this room. But um, it is going to be, I think there's going to be some, there's some interesting vehicle cases coming up about breaking encryption um, and for what the court, what lengths they will go through to get that. They're going to want to get that. Or you might spend some time I wouldn't say 10 years in jail unless you're a World Trade Center bomber. <laughs> but uh, you might spend some time in court while they're trying to work out how to get your key. And technically, if you're telling them the truth and but, you're convincing. And, and again, this depends probably on what you did. Um, we had a conversation earlier about the idea of exigent circumstances. Like there, there's an important reason we need this data now. Not just that it's convenient for the court that we need it now, but that we actually need it now. Uh, for example, to protect a minor or you know, another great reason um, sort of the, the better the reason they have to get that data, the more likely they are to hold you to it. So like Tiffany said, the World Trade Center, the first bombing run, um, in, in this case, let's, let's make you a really bad guy. And honestly, I don't know you and I apologize for this, but we're talking hypotheticals. So hypothetically, you're a really bad guy. There's a minor in danger. Information relating to the location of that minor is in your 10-year crypto puzzle. Um, they're gonna hold you for 10 years, and they're gonna work really hard to get that information out of you. Um, there's, a, there's a line between how hard they can work and how hard they can work. They're gonna work the second kind of hard. You, you, you will hurt. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, one part that I thought was particularly scary was when you were talking about pacemakers and uh, other medical devices and how you could potentially subpoena data from them. Uh, that's, well, that's horrible. Yes. Uh, and I'm, <laughs> so I'm, but it's so obviously horrible. I'm, I'm wondering if what you think about the possibility of using uh, that sort of case to present to uh, policymakers and say, look, this is, this is not good. And then well, use that to maybe gradually it, get them to uh, yeah, realize what's going on in the, the big the, picture. The use of log data in determining time of death is established. Um, it's a talk that's commonly given at uh, medical forensics conferences. You know, the best ways to remove an implantable device to ensure the forensic quality of the data. So it's not to ensure the, 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 the medical forensics, but to ensure the forensic quality of the data. And because this is a commonly given talk and because this is used to set time of death, it's gonna become one of those, uh, they always seem to happen in healthcare, those terrible balances between um, the best things for the greater good and the best things for personal privacy, and it's gonna become regime dependent. Um, for example, Canada has very strong uh, information privacy law. Our health privacy law is a mess uh, because it's provincially based, so there's uh, seven different um, privacy laws for health information, which is the invert of the United States, where health information is a federal law and it's well done, and information privacy is shattered amongst the states. In the EU, it's a little of both, so it depends on jurisdiction how much your privacy counts. And I'll say quickly, while we're talking about InfoSec, a lot of these devices that I've seen, uh, whether they're blood glucose meters or um, uh, like pacemakers, there isn't a lot of security um, from people being able to, to access the information. In fact, uh, Travis Goodspeed had an interesting, he's a, a hardware hacker from the US. Uh, he hacks Zigbee chips. He's hacked all of them. Some of these pacemakers communicate with radio communication. He's hacked those chips. So those companies need to go back and assess that information, how secure it is, protecting your information and uh, your personal identifying uh, 
uh, uh, information. There's an example that. at Black Hat 2008. Um, it turns out that automatic defibrillators have a test mode that's used when they're implanted and only when they're implanted that stops your heart. So if it has Zigbee in it and somebody's walking by you sending the um, test pattern command and you happen just to drop dead, whose fault is it really? Did your heart stop? Did the device stop your heart? How? We've never written bad software, ever. Does that help? Uh, well, yeah, but uh, it was actually kind of tangential to my... To what well, yeah, was, the, the, the real uh, answer is choose, uh, your, I mean, can we choose use, your jurisdiction. Yeah. Can we use this to affect policy? I mean, to show the horrible consequences and... You know, in, do you in, think people would be receptive to that kind of argument? Yes, that is exactly the argument we're asking people to make, and it's the regime dependency. So is your regime going to appreciate that and be able to do something about it, or does your regime not care? And so. when the regime did care, I know briefly it was when uh, former Vice President Dick Cheney was found to have one of these devices implanted in him that there was some speculation it could be messed with. That's when they started to care about security for medical devices. And we have just a couple more minutes. We'll take the last question quickly. Um, yeah, so I use uh, encryption on my la laptop, mostly mm -hmm. because I don't feel comfortable with, if the device ever gets stolen, um, some random uh, thief looking at my private data. However, I wonder, especially if you cross, uh, for example, the US border, will the fact that you have encryption on your laptop not make you more suspicious to law enforcement and make actually make it make, yeah, increase the chance of uh, search of uh, warrants, etc. Because I think 99% of the people crossing that border will not have encryption on their laptop. So the fact that you do it, um, you get the whole you have something to hide argument, which yeah, may cut yourself in the finger basically by taking care to encrypt. It, it, it depends. Um, I travel back and forth across the US border fairly frequently because I'm from Canada and I have my unstickered laptop and my stickered laptop. Um, my stickered laptop gets me pulled aside for security screening every single time. My unstickered one doesn't. And it doesn't matter what I'm wearing, whether I'm wearing a suit or whether I'm wearing jeans and a T-shirt. So that concept of um, profiling is done. Um, the reality is that the more corporate you look, the less likely they are to search and seize you. And the more corporate you are, the more likely it is your laptop will be encrypted. So what they'll end up doing, if they're going to do a seizure, and, and this has happened to um, business people from around the world, frankly, when they've crossed over, where there's been a preemptive uh, seizure, um, they will ask you for all the passwords necessary to access the operating system of your computer. They will pull the drive and encase it. And if they find any random data on your drive, they're going to say random data is probably encryption. Find the crypto software that's responsible. Try all of the passwords that you gave. If it doesn't open up, um, this may not happen synchronously. Like, you may have already left the airport, but you'll never see the laptop again, and you'll have a lot of difficulty the next time through the border. So what can you do to protect yourself? Um, be as unsuspicious as possible. So, you know. Yeah, but that's, so basically that's my uh, way of thinking. If you, want not to, if you want to be as unsuspicious as possible, yeah. don't encrypt. Just hide in plain sight. Exactly. Although I don't think that's the best security. Uh, you know, we're not going to say don't encrypt your stuff. We're saying encrypt. Um, and I think more people are beginning to use even PGP. It's getting so much easier on cell phones and whatnot. So. In encrypt, but don't be goofy about it. Don't use the hidden partitions. And don't use three different kinds of crypto software. Um, do the kind of thing that an average North American business person would do. Hold disk encryption, and you're good. Well... In my experience, the average uh, business person doesn't do any encryption, at least not in the, the branches I look at. So, uh, Assuming you work for a big corporation that does... Um, yeah, because but whole not disk encryption is really so. happening. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Right, thank thank you. you. I think we're out of time, but thanks very much uh, for having us here in the Netherlands. Thank you. I didn't get my words in. I want to thank everybody for being so nice. Because I'll tell you, if it was the other way around we wouldn't be as nice at speaking English and being as welcoming and friendly. Har has been an awesome experience, and I want to thank you all for having us here. It's very awesome.